bankrupt, but they can't go into federal receivership. So the city of uh, Vallejo went bankrupt, but the city council is still dominated by the unions. So they managed to not touch any of the existing pensions in their workout plan. Uh, so, so what was the point? You know, the state, state officials in California are not about to push us into, into federal receivership. Well, if you don't have that as, if you don't have that, if you don't have the legislature, then you're simply the, go to freeze and collapse. And, uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, do, I don't know what's going to happen, but something creative. I know in, uh, in Orange County, uh, this is a suit that, that would have uh, statewide ramifications. The Board of Supervisors is challenging the retroactivity in pensions. Uh, saying that it's an Ill, unconstitutional gift of public funds. I'm all for those uh, sorts of challenges um, that maybe one of them will, maybe one of them will play. The problem is that the courts at every level have, have rebuked attempts to rein in current pensions. I've heard one argument that we could uh, shut down the, the existing, in other words, if you, work, if you work for the government, we say, okay, we make good up to today, but we, we shut down this pension system today. And starting tomorrow, you, you benefit from a new pension system that's much lower benefit. Yeah, but you're breaching a, a, an established contract. Probably. Well, that's what, the, that's what the courts have said. But on the other hand, but if, when you go into bankruptcy, all contracts Right, are except then, as I mentioned in Vallejo, they, chose, they, did, they, didn't, they didn't void any of the contracts. So it's, it would be nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm all for uh, bankruptcy as a, as a possible option. Um, what do you see as the uh, feasibility or institutional impediments to um, transitioning from defined benefit to defined contribution pensions? I mean, it's, it's we, we could all sit down and come up with some really simple ways to fix the problem. We could at least start by all new employees defined contribution. Uh, in fact, Meg Whitman uh, mentioned that in a debate the other night, except then she, uh, she had a big caveat where she wasn't going to do that for public safety, which then why bother, that's 70% of the problem. But anyway, there is some discussion of it, uh, and that's a good idea. But the unions, I, I was at the uh, hearing where uh, SB 19, it was a Senate proposal, a governor and Republican proposal that would create just a new lesser defined benefit plan, so not even nearly as radical as that. And you'd think the world was ending. I mean, the unions showed up in force, and, they, and the CalPERS was there, and they were all uh, you know, upset and opposed to it, and the Democrats who control the legislature wouldn't hear any of it. They wouldn't. They wouldn't put it. They wouldn't. They voted it down. It never. It never got much of a hearing. So. So yeah, it's a good idea. It's a political problem, though. And and I don't think that we're going to be able to consider those things until the problem gets worse. And and it's hard to imagine how much worse it has to get. But at this point. Uh, there, there isn't that much stomach for it. Uh, among, there is no stomach for it among a majority party. Uh, what, they, what the Democrats said was, well, ha well, these issues should be handled at the negotiating table. But it's at the negotiating table where we've created these huge benefits. So uh, good luck, right? I mean, but it's a good idea. That's what I think. I was curious. I want to mention one thing. That cop you said was uh, in Florida. If he says he's paying in taxes, don't they have no income tax? Florida? Yeah. Uh, oh, this is a side comment. I mean, but oh yeah, I don't know, but I I just I have no I don't know whether if you have a New York pension. So I know Derek Jeter when he's down there he doesn't pay he doesn't pay but for, do you, for the percent of time he's down there. Yeah. I, outside New York. Anyway, that's just a side comment. But yeah, the main I question I was curious about was I know unions are really strong. I've always heard they're very strong and they always have the legislators ear, etc. And my, but my I'm just curious if you have you know what the numbers are for if the union leader says you know we support this. How many? What percent of that union votes, and what percent of the voters actually follow that recommendation? Oh, in terms of yeah, like so. Besides raising hell, that's one, and that's really visible to the, and they don't want to ruffle the feathers. But how does that actually follow through to the actual voting of? of yeah, do you know? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, a lot of people have said, you know, in some of the police unions in particular, uh, vote a lot more Republican than their leadership. Their leadership tends to be entirely Democratic. But I do sense that the uh, union members uh, are vote overwhelmingly Democratic, uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, their leadership certainly is Democratic. The money goes uh, mostly to Democrats or to Republicans who toe the line. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what uh, anything of percentages of, of the rank and file members. I mean, there are, I, you know, I know union guys, I'm on friendly terms with a number of them, even some union officials, but, um, you know, they vote their pocketbook. And uh, I remember, uh, well, I'm from Pennsylvania originally, and in Pennsylvania,
Pennsylvania, you have a lot of the a lot of the voters are uh, the Democratic voters are very conservative on uh, social issues and uh, um, you know they they're the Reagan Democrats, right? But they but they vote their pocketbook uh, and. Uh, you know, they, they end up being, uh, you know, supporting uh, union policies even though they're very conservative. Although usually they're conservative in the ways that I'm not. I mean, they tend to manage to get it all wrong. But anyway. <laughs> uh, anyone else? You, just an observation. You, you made a comment that you don't see what can happen or what's going to happen. And I've made the observation many times in the past that what we have in this political system is a system of positive feedback. We don't have the correct kind of negative feedback that's appropriate for a system to settle down to an operative mode that can be sustained. Instead, what we have is a system that will oscillate out of control until it fails catastrophically. So instead of poli sci, maybe they need to take a course in mechanical engineering. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we could be headed towards catastrophic failure. I, I, when I say I don't know what's going to happen, I mean, I, it's, um, I, I don't really, you know, nobody does, but it's hard to, I, I just really don't see where this leads to because our, our latest budget in California just kicks the can down the road. Everybody admits it immediately that they passed the budget 100 days late, uh, half of it is a complete fraud. Uh, so we'll have a new governor and a new legislature that will be roughly of the same viewpoint and same, you know, uh, as the last one. So, so what are they going to do? Well, they're going to they're going to muddle through in the same process that we have now right. until what the financial markets start uh, well, imposing if, some discipline. If we could instill a little bit of negative feedback, for example, you mean for every voters, day that the yeah. legislature doesn't balance, doesn't pass the budget, they have to pay the state's bills out of their own pockets. Well, I don't think anyone could afford that. But, but, well, but sure, you, I'm all for being sure that if there was a sufficient negative penalty involved, that they would act on time. Yeah, it's, it's so there's no a sufficient deterrent. Well, I, I'm all for uh, for better deterrence. I mean, something uh, you know, I, I'd be all ears for what kind of initiative could be proposed that would would put uh, you know a lot. Of, What's one of, one of them? Was that thrown out the uh, the, the restriction on uh, legislators' pay when the budget isn't? In? That's on the ballot. Is that on the ballot? Okay. Uh, yeah, you know things like that are, are nice. I mean, but I, I don't really think they're going to change the dynamic. What you what you have is in uh, the California, you know, the Democrats see see increasing taxes is pretty much the only answer that I can see, and the Republicans, no new taxes are there. You know, that's their mantra, and. So, um, and you have a two-thirds vote requirement so, uh, uh, to pass a budget. So, and the Republicans have more than a third. And, uh, and you know, the last time uh, Republicans uh, voted to uh, increase taxes, there was hell to pay from their own caucus. So, uh, so that's what, what you're at this impasse. And you have the head of the assembly, you know, John Perez, is a union organizer. So he treats these negotiations like union uh, organizing, so he uh, he was the guy who was led the uh, grocery strike in, uh, in Southern California. So uh, now the Democrats are hoping uh, that Prop 25 will pass, which would uh, which would have a, a majority vote rather than a two-thirds vote, uh, but that would make it much much easier for the Democrats to raise taxes. Uh, but I know some Republicans who say, well, let let them have it. At least there might be some accountability in their vote. And we will get one huge tax increase, but then maybe the public will react sufficiently against that. I am for the public reacting uh, harshly, and uh, although uh, you know the Tea Party isn't all of it isn't my cup of tea. Um, in fact, I spoke to a oh, great cliche, but uh, I spoke to a Tea Party group where people gave me a hard time talking about the same subject because so many of the people who were part of that group uh, were retired state workers, right? So, <laughs> you know, keep, keep their taxes low, but, uh, you know, don't touch their pension. So I just think it's, I think the Tea Party people are, are sufficiently, um, are angry, the right to be angry. They have a lot of good ideas. They also, have, it's also a populist movement where there are all sorts of ideas. I think they're just people who are pissed off and, and uh, like the Ross Perot folks, which you, you all are too young to remember, but yeah, the, uh, they're angry, but they don't know what to do about it. So uh, I think the anger's good. I, I know when I was, um, 
when I was in Orange County, and I still write a weekly column for the Orange County Register, uh, the politics there are dominated by Republicans. And uh, so my whole goal was to just inflict pain on Republicans, because the Democrats didn't care what I had to say. But if a Republican did something bad, I would beat the crap out of them. And uh, the, uh, the, you know, a couple of the super Republican supervisors and then assembly members who voted for some of these pension spiking deals, I, I just, I just wrote their case, and they're still angry at me. You know, I would, one of them I would refer to. Uh, you know how in, uh, in writing, um, uh, in the newspaper, you'll see like assemblyman. His name is Todd Spitzer, and then you'd say R dash Orange, the city that they're from. Right, he's from the city of Orange. I put R dash unions, and, uh, and then uh, that sort of thing. And I would do those little things in stories, and that would just drive them crazy. And uh, but but I do think uh, inflicting pain. I mean, the Bell situation is a great example. I mean, those folks, uh, they, uh, the the city officials, they were scared. They left. They they quit, right? And I think if people were angry enough, um, that's where a lot of it, a lot of change comes. I, I know in my uh, Back to my first book about eminent domain, uh, we tried, we stopped, when I was at the register, we stopped a lot of really bad eminent domain proceedings against homeowners and uh, small business owners, really unjust.